suppose we give them timings. Please, please. Yes, sir. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the AOCN Back to School Wednesdays. This is a, a AOCN fundamental lecture series, uh, primarily for practicing uh, and uh, pediatricians. So, today we'll be discussing uh, approach to a child with ataxia. So, uh, approach to a ataxic child requires uh, so much detailed history, careful CNS examination and then some selected blood work and uh, uh, maybe neuroimaging and uh, nowadays increasingly available genetic studies. So Dr. Guraya will take us through the journey of uh, 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 a child and uh, Dr. Maya Thomas uh, will be moderating the session. Next slide, please. Stay. Dr. Maya Thomas uh, is professor and head of pediatric neurology uh, department of Neu neurosciences in CMC Bellore. She needs no introduction. And uh, I think, Ma Dr. Maya, over to you to introduce Dr. Buraya and let's begin the session. And your mute, please unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gurpreet. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank AOCN and uh, Dr. Kanaita and Dr. Kavita for giving me this opportunity. And uh, pediatric neuro, as we all know, is an ever-expanding field with new uh, genes and genetic disorders being added to the list of differential uh, diagnosis. But uh, <clears throat> despite these uh, advances, uh, uh, paramount is a good clinical history and examination and a thorough knowledge of uh, anatomy and uh, physiology. Uh, so I'm sure uh, uh, our speaker for the day will uh, take us uh, through this. And uh, Dr. Jatinder Goraya is a vibrant uh, pediatric uh, neurologist, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he's no uh, stranger, at least in the pediatric neurology field. And Dr. Goraya is a professor of uh, pediatric neurology at uh, Dayanand Medical College and Hospital uh, Ludhiana with several publications um, and uh, chapters to various books. Over to you, Dr. Goraya. All right, uh, good evening everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Maya Thomas and uh, Dr. Gurpit Kocher for having me here uh, for this talk for uh, largely for postgraduate students uh, in pediatrics and uh, uh, practicing pediatricians. So uh, this is going to be a talk with the, uh, which is going to be a lot of basic rather than a very uh, complicated advanced uh, genetic uh, ataxia as I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, in the outset, uh, uh, some of the uh, images I have obviously taken from uh, internet, but majority of belong to my own collection. Uh, some of the uh, pictures are from known textbooks of pediatric neurology, uh, just to help residents understand uh, various uh, uh, kind of uh, intricacies of examination of a child with ataxia. Uh, let me see. Right, okay. So uh, as you know, uh, there are different kind of ataxias or different pathophysiological mechanisms causing ataxia in children. Uh, I will be largely focusing on cerebellar ataxia uh, of course, I'll refer to sensory ataxia, vestibular ataxia uh, a little bit uh, just to uh, make a differential diagnosis uh, uh, between these ataxias, but the talk is largely uh, restricted to cerebellar disorders causing ataxia. Uh, 
Now, the talk will cover a basic cerebellar anatomy uh, as relevant to understanding cerebellar ataxia. Ataxia is a predominant component. And then uh, how to recognize or how to perform uh, various uh, uh, clinical signs to elicit signs of ataxia, uh, then cl classification of ataxia, common conditions will be discussed, uh, which pediatrician and pediatric residents are going to encounter in their practice. And then uh, for a, a little bit about the uh, uh, genetic and hereditary ataxias, uh, uh, where the physical examination can provide clues to etiology, but that is not the focus of today's talk. Now, the cerebellum uh, is uh, necessary for performance of uh, smooth, uh, uh, measured and directed uh, uh, voluntary movements so that they appear very graceful, like everyone has it. And this is done through controlling rate, uh, range, direction, and force of voluntary movements. That's what it is. In addition to these movements, cerebellum is also responsible for correcting and adjusting upright postures in space. So any, any change in posture is immediately taken care and corrected by the cerebellum. Uh, as a result, uh, whenever there is cerebellar dysfunction, we see uh, that the disturbance lies in the motor control, muscle uh, tone regulation, and coordination of skilled movements. And that's what you see as uh, ataxia uh, clinically. Uh, the cerebellum, uh, everyone knows, uh, uh, at least from the medical students' day, that it's a main structure in the posterior fossa intracranially, and uh, it's used to be called as a little brain, and uh, it's connected to the rest of the brain, predominantly through brain stem, uh, by means of uh, what we call cerebellar peduncles. Uh, I'll refer to these structures uh, uh, in next slides. Uh, this and two cellular uh, cerebellar hemispheres. So this is the midline vermis, and these are the two cerebellar hemispheres joined. They are not uh, anatomically separate, but uh, at least um, morphologically, they can be identified differently. And uh, each uh, cerebellar, uh, cerebellum or half cerebellum, or the, uh, the cerebellum is divided into three lobes uh, by uh, two fissures. One is the interior or primary fissure, and the then you have a posterolateral uh, fissure. The interior divides, uh, separates anterior and posterior lobes of the cerebellum, and then the, the posterolateral uh, sulcus or the fissure separates the posterior from the flocculonodular lobe. So these three lobes, and each lobe of vermis as well as the cerebellum has further uh, divisions into lobules, which I don't think are necessary to understand uh, at, at this level of talk. Uh, phylogenetically, uh, the cerebellum is divided into three uh, uh, parts, the uh, RC cerebellum or vestibular cerebellum, which predominantly includes flocculonodular lobe, and this controls body equilibrium and eye movements. The second is spinocerebellum or paleocerebellum, uh, predominantly uh, the uh, vermis of the interior lobe and some other parts of the uh, 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 cerebral hemispheres. And this part of the brain is responsible for controlling tone uh, as well as movements of the uh, axial and limb musculature. And lastly, the new, the newest part of the cerebellum, the new cerebellum, and it's also called corticocerebellum or corticopontocerebellum or cerebro. Uh, cerebral, uh, cerebrocerebellum. And this is the uh, largely middle portion of the vermis and most of the cerebellar hemisphere. And this is involved in planning and initiation of movements and as well as uh, regulation of fine limb movements. So basically, uh, the purpose of uh, uh, the cerebellum is to uh, uh, control and regulate movements in such a way that movements appear very refined and graceful uh, rather than uh, uh, clumsy. And uh, uh, just, just to remember that there are four cerebellar nuclei starting from medial to lateral, uh, vestigial, globose, emboliform, and dentate. And, the, and these nuclei are, nuclei are the main source of cerebellar efferents, which go to the different parts of the brain. And uh, we can see uh, the main uh, big nucleus, the largest nucleus is the 
dentate nucleation, which we can see on even on the neuroimaging. This little dark part is representing curved part is representing the uh, dentate nucleus. Then uh, I said cerebellum image connected to the rest of the brain through uh, brainstem uh, and by means of peduncles, the superior cerebellar peduncle, middle cerebellar peduncle, and inferior cerebellar peduncle. But just to mention that the superior cerebellar peduncle contains different fibers, uh, which go rossly and decussate in the caudal midbrain. The middle cerebral peduncle contains efferent from the, uh, largely from the pons. And the inferior cerebral peduncle uh, has efferents from the medulla and spinal cord. Of course, there are other uh, fibers which pass through these uh, cerebral peduncles, but those are the three main types of uh, fibers, uh, efferent and efferent fibers, which are conveyed uh, between uh, the cerebellum and the rest of the brain through these peduncles. And then these are three uh, diagrammatically represented cerebral peduncles, superior rostral cerebral peduncle, this is middle cerebral peduncle connected to the pons, and then we have an inferior cerebral uh, well, a peduncle connected to the medulla, and this can be seen in this picture as well. And uh, this is just uh, because these pictures are going to come. Uh, this is how the cerebellum looks on uh, MRI, on the axial images. This is pons, middle cerebellar peduncle, vermis, and two cerebral hemispheres. This is the sagittal section from the midline. You can see these uh, vermis here. You can see the tonsils here, this is tentorium cerebelli, this is posterior fossa, fourth ventricle, and aqueduct of sylvius and tectum. And this is the coronal section showing the cerebellar hemisphere and midline uh, vermis. Uh, just to know that uh, uh, these are the images which are going to repeat uh, in uh, uh, further uh, lecture. Now, when do we suspect ataxia in a child? Uh, now, ataxia can come as purely a toxic symptom, or it can be a part of many other presentations. But here I'm going to focus on that. Uh, when should you suspect ataxia in any person or in any child? I think the one of the very common symptoms of, uh, 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 of it is difficulty, staggering, stumbling, falling, uh, and uh, uh, the parents say child doesn't try, uh, walk right or he's walking to one side when he walks if kind of veers to one side or falls to one side and in severe cases might have lost the ability to walk uh, the characteristic uh, gait of a drunk person is what it defines cerebellar gait uh, we are showing uh, the ataxia or uh, gait difficulty uh, attacks a gate in a person uh, with a cerebellar attacks. Yeah, and there's no uh, better example than seeing a person who's inebriated or drunk. Now, the other symptoms might include uh, unsteady or wobbly head because of head tremors. A person or child may not be able to sit or stand, not because of weakness, but because of poor balance. And whenever, he, whenever he's made to sit, he stays and falls. Uh, that's complaints by the family. Shaky eyes uh, causing some kind of visual difficulty is a possibility. Uh, generally, this is not the complaint unless until the, the shaky eyes are uh, kind of too bad, like an obstacleness or ocular flutter, their parents might notice that as a first symptom. Change in speech. Uh, uh, more often noted are uh, described in adults, but children don't have uh, the young children have a speech which is different from adult. So speech change may not be easily identified by children, but whenever it is identified, it's described as slurred, garbled, intoxicated, drunk speech, a uh, speech of a person who's been intoxicated or drunk. Uh, you, and we'll talk about a little bit again. And difficulty swallowing can sometimes be a symptom uh, when there's severe incoordination of uh, musculature of uh, the, swallow the swallowing muscles. Uh, it's generally part of the whole spectrum, not the predominant or com uh, chief complaint. In hands and arms, uh, the patient might come with a difficulty using hands uh, uh, gracefully and uh, kind of uh, without any and tremors. So if there is some problem, then the difficulty with drinking from a glass or difficult uh, when person is drinking, they're spilling and smearing of the face. Uh, there will be difficulty using spoon, even buttoning and unbuttoning might require a lot of effort. Patient might be unable to pour water into the glass or cup. 
for kids, worsening or sloppy handwriting may be another symptom of uh, uh, cerebral ataxia or ataxia per se. And tremors uh, when reaching for objects or reaching for a target, as, for example, reaching for a glass or reaching for something else may be a kind of a complaint uh, of uh, ataxia. Now coming to uh, the signs of cerebral dysfunction, a signs of uh, what are the signs? How do we list will be uh, kind of uh, talked about uh, in this section of this talk? Now, ataxia uh, as a word means without order. Texas means order. It is without order, means clumsiness without a kind of uh, coordination. And ataxia does not only mean ataxia of limbs or ataxia of uh, walking. Ataxia refers to all the muscular in coordination, whether this is part of limbs or trunk or is part of uh, even the uh, ocular movements or even speech. So uh, because of uh, there is a defect in timing of sequential contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles, which happen in normal voluntary movements. So patient has uh, uh, some kind of muscular in coordination of poor balance. This happens because, because of cerebellar dysfunction, the movements uh, are defective we don't perform all the movements without even realizing that the, the movements are uh, determined by speed, range, force, and timing because we all have normal, but it's only when the patient has a problem that he, he understands the, the, the importance of these uh, parameters. Uh, this uh, ataxia or uh, abnormal uh, co in coordination, uh, coordination uh, may affect limbs, trunk, gait, speech, swallowing, or even eye movements. And uh, these signs are related to uh, all this uh, uh, effect of all these structures. So in the head, the sign of ataxia generally titubation, which is a slow uh, two to three hertz anterior posterior uh, kind of movements of uh, the head uh, while sitting and sometimes also called titubation. The upper extremity tremors or upper extremity ataxia is determined by classically by finger nose testing, where the patient uh, sitting uh, extends his arm and uh, tries to touch his nose by bringing it back with the fingertip. So this movement normally is very smooth. Everyone can perform it, but in a patient who has finger nose ataxia, the movements are tremulous, and when this reaches the target, even then it it can miss the target and go left and right, uh, which is again part of dysmetria. So uh, when when patient is not able to judge the distance uh, and near appropriate force. Uh, to the moments the patient can have a dysmetria, which means the error of judgment in the distance, the movement has to be performed for. If the, your finger kind of overshoots, it's hypermetria, and if it is, and it, if it undershoots, it's hypometria. Then the other is uh, dysdidokinesia, which means uh, impairment in performance of rapid alternating movements can be performed by when you extend your hands and then extend your wrist, and then make alternate uh, movements of uh, inward and outward rotation. And a normal person can do it, but uh, in, on the affected side, if it is on the one side, the movements get kind of disrupted and incoordinated, and that alternation is lost. Uh, similarly, uh, the another way of doing it is tapping on the thigh alternately by supinating and pronating your forearm. And normally it should be, again, very smooth and uh, uh, graceful and not kind of disjointed. So that's another sign of uh, cerebellar dysfunction and upper extremity, which we perform clinically. Then the rebound phenomena, in which uh, uh, patient is unable to control or check the movement. So this is as the photograph shows is performed by having patient uh, flexes for arm and the examiner is resisting and then suddenly examiner lets it go. And normally after a little bit of movement, patient is able to kind of control it. But in case of ataxia, this, this con the control is uh, not possible. And the range of movements which patient has when the examiner releases the form, uh, form uh, 
is more than uh, required and even patient might hit his face. So this is uh, called a rebound phenomenon. There's another way of looking at these two signs uh, by having the patient extend his arms and, uh, 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 and the examiner tries to just tap the, tap the uh, uh, arm or wrist to just displace it. And a normal person immediately comes back to the uh, original uh, uh, position. But in a patient who has ataxia, it oscillates up and down before it really comes. It overshoots and then comes back. So that is, uh, again, uh, uh, same thing, uh, which is like uh, uh, dysmetria. And then uh, rebound can be in the same kind of maneuver. Rebound can be tested. We tell the patient to kind of... Uh, uh, hold them straight and then the examiner tells the pit, keep it there and the examiner will try to push it down and then certainly release it. This, this arm will go very high up uh, instead of just moving it up and coming back, which is like, again, this is a rebound. So this has been what can elicit a lot of signs um, uh, related to ataxia. Even when arms are extended, if patient uh, the fingers can kind of move up and down a little bit of choreoathetide movement called pseudoathetosis, which is in you know, sensory ataxia. Lower limbs, similarly, uh, the classic uh, uh, heel shin test, heel is brought to the head and, and down to the uh, chin, it's slid down to the ankle and again lifted up and brought back. So any ataxia can be uh, uh, checked uh, inability or to uh, bring the heel on the shin uh, and then kind of putting shin left or right is a kind of sign of ataxia. And even then the heel goes down the shin, it goes in a ataxic way or tremulous way. Shin tapping, uh, same way, but the patient keep on repeatedly tapping the uh, shin with the heel. Uh, it's a, again, it goes left and right, uh, say, uh, telling us that it's a toxic toe to finger, like finger to nose. The toe can be brought to touch patient uh, examiner's finger. And again, you can notice the ataxia foot tapping. The just like a uh, hand tapping, you can keep on tapping the uh, ground hand with your foot. And you can see uh, kind of regularity rhythm uh, and coordination of that tapping to decide uh, uh, as a sign of ataxia. Then gait, uh, cerebellar gait is atax, uh, classically white based. And there's a lot of trunkal sway. Uh, steps are very unsteady and irregular and patient tends to fall and even falls. If there's a kind of a midline or diffuse dysfunction, the the fall may be to either side, but if it is on the one side, uh, cerebellum is affected, then uh, uh, patient might be to one side when he's walking. And uh, patients with the cerebellar gait has especially uh, difficulty when they turn, uh, they're walking and they're made to turn. These patients are unable to do tandem walking. If they're made to walk around a chair, they will, uh, if there is the, uh, the uh, ataxia is on the same side as uh, of that the side uh, on which it is. The ataxia of uh, speech is called dysarthria here. It's irregular, slow, slurred, robotic, scanning. A lot many words have been used. But again, remember the drunk person. Uh, his speech uh, is a classically dysarthric speech. Hypotonia generally seen after acute cerebellar result, uh, stroke or uh, even acute cerebellitis or cerebellar ataxia. Uh, there is some role of uh, cerebellum in cognition, effect, and behavior, but that's not where we're going. Uh, there's something called uh, cerebellar uh, affective syndrome. Eye signs include gaze evoked in nystagmus, which means when you look eccentrically and you have a nystagmus with a fast component eccentrically and slow component uh, going uh, to the uh, midline. The eye movements like uh, uh, in the dysmetria and the uh, extremities, the scardic eye movements are also dysmetric, which means this overshoot or undershoot the target. They don't go the target directly, so it can be Again, uh, uh, hypometric scades or hypermetric scades. And uh, the pursuit movements, which are the following, 
instead of smoothly falling, the movements are jerky like saccades. The pursuits become scars. The other signs of cerebellar dysfunction in eye include ocular flutter, opsoclonus, I'll show one example, ocular bobbing and skewed uh, deviation. The uh, next part is uh, common etiologies uh, of uh, acute ataxia uh, of ataxia in children. Uh, before we go into uh, etiology, I think uh, the most uh, common cause of cerebellar ataxia uh, not drank alcohol and a little bit more than he could have it. Uh, so that uh, I showed you the example. And even a vestibular ataxia is a, in the children is common uh, physiologically under situation where kids kind of spin around. And when they stop suddenly, then they, uh, they have ataxia that tend to fall and uh, that's a vestibular ataxia. And uh, sensory ataxia, I think we as a junkie probably have experienced this. Even we experienced we were sitting for a long time at one place and with legs go numb. And when we stand up and try to walk, and all the symptoms of numbness and not able to put your foot there and being tendency to fall is a normal sensory ataxia. Just to understand what these vestibular sensory and uh, cerebellar ataxias are. Now, uh, the variety of causes causing ataxia, starting from congenital, which largely includes the malformations of cerebellum. And uh, then uh, there are genetic and uh, degenerative causes. We'll be talking about them. I'm just naming them endocrine, especially the hypothyroidism. Infections are post infectious causes, one of the very common causes of acute ataxia in children. Uh, uh, then, metabolic, uh, we always, as a pediatricians, uh, keep in mind a specific metabolic disorder which can cause ataxia. A few of them will be named later on. Then, tumors of uh, uh, if you include alcohol, the most common cause probably, then from our pediatric point of view, the medications are one of the causes of trauma and vascular, especially stroke. Uh, we don't see cerebellar hemorrhage as often as we see the stroke, basilar migraine. Uh, uh, and then, of course, last, uh, the psychogenic or functional like emotional reactions, especially in adolescents, uh, has to be kept in mind when dealing with ataxia. So how do we go about it? Uh, of course, history, physical examination, neuroimaging, laboratory investigation, genetic testing, that's generally the order of uh, uh, going uh, for investigating into, into uh, the uh, cerebellar ataxia. Uh, important points will be discussed in history, what do we need to understand. Uh, need to know in the history to understand. So most important is age of onset, then the course of illness uh, to decide whether this acute, subacute, or chronic, progressive or non-progressive ataxia, associated neurological symptoms will help you understand the etiology. Are there any signs of raised ICT like uh, headache, vomiting, diplopia, and house vision, hearing, all uh, any any other neurological symptoms we have to talk about because we don't know what part of the neuroaxis is involved. Uh, it's the cerebellum or the rest of the brain is also involved. The non-neurological symptoms of uh, like having a febrile illness concurrently are preceding the onset of symptoms. Recent vaccination, recent trauma, symptoms related to GI, for example, diarrhea or failure to thrive, history of ingestion, drug exposure, toxin exposure is important. And uh, uh, the history is incomplete if we haven't focused on uh, family history and consumer. Uh, especially for autosomal recessive ataxia. Physical examination is done to confirm ataxia. And then the type of ataxia confirmation comes from, uh, of course, uh, examination looking for all the signs of the ataxia. We look for associated neurological findings, uh, particularly the cranial involvement, focal deficits, mental status examination, presence of other kinds of involuntary movements, and then any signs to suggest that there is a sensory or vestibular deficit. Non-neurological physical findings can tell you, uh, can help you kind of uh, uh, taper your investigation in certain directions. Cataract stratagesias, we'll talk about a little bit about optic atrophy, hypostomomaly, so many other signs. I can't enumerate every sign associated with these disorders. And this is a list of uh, 
non ataxic signs hyperreflexia airflexia extensor plantar response spasticity weakness muscle atrophy fasciculations myoclonus rigidity chorea dystonia which means uh, almost uh, uh, any other signs uh, and which can tell you the diagnosis for example oculomotor apraxia is a uh, part of ataxia telangiectasia and uh, Oculomotor apraxia, uh, ataxia with oculomotor apraxia types, uh, different types, Joubert syndrome. Cataracts are seen in patients who have uh, 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 cerebrotendinous gentomatosis or even uh, other uh, uncommon syndromes. Myokemia in episodic epi, uh, ataxia. Stranectasia is commonly uh, part of uh, ataxia tendinectasia. So, just uh, basically, it means that you examine the child completely both general physical and neurological examination. Neuroimaging, probably the most important, the single most important use for diagnostic modality in any child, whether this is acute ataxia, or this is a, uh, intermittent or even chronic ataxia. Uh, it can be diagnostic uh, in congenital malformations. I'll show you some example, brain tumors, stroke, cerebralitis, uh, cerebral abscess, demyelinating cerebral atrophy, and in certain cases, Normal, even normal can help you uh, kind of uh, decide the etiology. Now, after doing all those things, uh, I think we have decided whether we're dealing with a patient who has a cerebellar ataxia, sensory ataxia, or a vestibular ataxia. And just to enumerate uh, certain uh, differentiating features, uh, sensory ataxia is lost due to loss of sensory inputs through cerebellum. So cerebellum doesn't get uh, the proprioceptive impulses to it, so it cannot decide where the lips are. So patients frequently uh, have a sensory symptoms like numbness and other paresthesias. Uh, ataxia in sensory ataxia is worse in dim light or eyes closed. Romberg sign is present, pseudoethetosis I talked about. And when you test formally, there is loss of proportion. Tender flexes may be reduced or absent and uh, nystagmus and dysarthria are absent. In vestibular ataxia, the vestibular input to the cerebellum is impaired. So other than ataxia, you have nausea, vomiting, and then the intensive vertigo, which, uh, which doesn't let patient change his head portion. And the and, um, vertigo worsens with the change in head portion. And symptoms may be is very important, which means jumping images. When whatever you see seems like jumping, and uh, there is head impulse test, uh, which is abnormal. All these things that the patient probably has a vestibular ataxia. Yeah. Now, next thing you have decided by this time, having gone through history examination, is that whether this ataxia is acute or subacute, or is it chronic, progressive or non progressive, or is it episodic ataxia? And we'll talk about a few examples of each one. Now, acute ataxia are probably the most common forms of ataxia in children. Most of them are acquired. Uh, really, they can be kind of uh, hereditary or genetic in origin, especially the episodic ataxia, at least first time they start. The cause is usually easily found through neuroimaging, and uh, other costly investigations generally are not required, and uh, many of them are actually treatable. But of course, acute means they can be life-threatening in certain situations, I'll show you the examples. Causes of acute axias, uh, first category is infectious, para-infectious, falling infections, acute cerebellar ataxia, or during infection, sometimes the involvement of a cerebellum, what's called cerebellitis by viral infections. Drugs, another common cause, cerebellar infarctions, or posterior circulation stroke, migraine, and then cerebellar tumors, uh, some immune-mediated cerebellar ataxia, as I'll mention, and then functional. This is a, a bigger list of uh, causes of uh, uh, acute cerebellar ataxia. Now, let's go by some just started a day earlier, uh, he started staggering and falling. And then uh, over the next 24 hours, he was completely uh, unable to walk or even sit. A few days ago, he had, uh, has had, uh, had had mild URA symptoms, which had resolved. And on examination, he's unable to sit and hold neck. He's irritable. Limb movements are, of course, symmetric and strong. And his reach for toys is tremulous. Uh, no obvious nystagmus here. And he refused to walk, possibly because of severe ataxia. His basic labs were normal, brain MRI normal, and CSF examination normal. 
So this is a uh, very common scenario, and uh, uh, and this this is generally called uh, acute post-infectious uh, cerebellar ataxia. Sorry, it's, uh, yeah, acute post-infectious cerebellar ataxia. And the most common cause of acute ataxia in children, more than 50% of acute ataxia uh, in children are due to this. Largely a disease of young children between three to five years of age, though it can happen at other ages also. Follows uh, infections uh, or vaccinations and the onset of ataxia is generally abrupt. And within 72 hours, most of the patients will come to you. With the treatment uh, results over two weeks. Now, uh, uh, it's a good prognosis. Now, same uh, uh, kind of thing, but uh, slightly seen differently is acute cerebellitis. Here we, uh, the MRI in acute post-infectious cerebral, uh, cerebral ataxia is generally normal or normal. Here we see changes uh, in the cerebellum, unilateral, bilateral, uh, and uh, it shows uh, cerebellar swelling also. And both acute cerebral ataxia and uh, acute cerebellitis follows uh, certain viral infections. Common are varicella, EBV, cytomegalococcus, influenza, rotavirus, equivirus, and currently, uh, just uh, recently, very recently, COVID-19 uh, cases of cerebellitis have been reported following this. Mycoplasma. Uh, symptoms and post-infectious uh, acute cerebral ataxia. Other than ataxia, uh, pure ataxia, like uh, the, those patients have here with fever, headache, dysarthria, altered mental status, ACT, from massive enlargement of cerebellum and occlusion of uh, even the uh, fourth ventricle and development of hydrocephalus. So herniation can occur, this patient can actually die if not recognized early. And these patients require very close monitoring, treatment with steroids, and if needed, surgery, especially uh, if there's a bending herniation and hydrocephalus. Not to forget is uh, another cause of acute cerebellar uh, uh, ataxia, is acute cerebellar stroke, not uncommon in uh, pediatric neurology practice, but in general practice, maybe not that common. So here we see involvement of uh, and corresponding uh, ADC uh, and diffusion maps showing that this is a diffusion restriction indicating acute stroke. So this child will have symptoms which are limited to the right side. Uh, so if she lateral ataxic symptoms in upper and lower extremities. Uh, little another variation of the same theme: uh, acute or subacute onset. Uh, and other than ataxia, this patient also has headache, vomiting, double vision, and with the fever. The symptoms are a little longer than just a very acute ataxia. So three differential diagnoses enter. This is a cerebellar abscess and the right cerebellar hemisphere, a lot of edema around. This is a midline brain tumor, uh, possibly medulloblastoma. And this is a uh, something peculiar to our setup in India is a cerebellar tuberculomas, conglomerate tuberculomas. So these can cause uh, acute or uh, subacute ataxia with the febrile illness. Uh, and you will know the relevant history of low grade fever, and headache, vomiting going on for a couple of weeks, uh, especially in uh, this patient. Uh, another example, of which is uh, uh, not an, an uncommon cause of a cerebellar ataxia, acute ataxia, three year old boy with a traumatic brain injury recovered well discharged on phenytoin, uh, four milligram per uh, four ml. Twice daily, which comes out to four milligram per kilogram per day. Five days later, after discharge, he comes back with irritability and vomiting. And on examination, he's very irritable, dehydrated, unable to hold neck or sit, has nystagmus. His basic lab for normal cranial bleeding was normal. So uh, we did serum phenytoin, which was very high. And uh, what turns out to be this mistake, which I'm sure every pediatric neurologist and maybe even pediatrician have not, would have noticed in the past. The, the one preparation contains 30 milligram per 5 ml and the other contains 125 milligram per 5 ml. And the pharmacist substituted because one was not available. The eptoin was not available. So dilantin was given. And obviously uh, this patient had acute ataxia because of ferritin overdose. 
So ferritin can cause two kinds of ataxia, acute ataxia and chronic ataxia. Acute follows uh, intoxication like this. Uh, or it can be intentional drug overdose, sometimes drug interaction when patient is taking phenytoin and also some other drug which raises its levels. Uh, we don't recognize it, but a lot of patients who receive 20 to 30 milligram per kilogram of loading dose for their seizures, acute seizure or status epilepticus, if they recover very early, if they are made to walk, they all have uh, ataxia. This is probably one of the very common cause of ataxia, but since it resolves within 24 hours, 48 hours, we hardly pay any attention to it. The chronic administration of phenytoin causes cerebral Trophy and uh, some of them may not actually have a lot of peritoneal symptoms, but these patients, of course, have other signs of phenytoin toxicity like coarse faces, uh, hair on the face, and uh, megaloblastic anemia and uh, gum hypoplasia. Other drugs should also be kept in mind uh, for a cause of ataxia, whether accidental or intentional. The carbamazepine, phenobob, metronidazole is another one. Okay. Uh, any child with acute ataxia where you think child may have a just uh, uh, acute cerebral ataxia, keep this diagnosis also in mind. It's not uncommon. 30-month-old uh, girl with progressive sleep disturbances and on examination has signs of uh, cerebral ataxia. Uh, uh, unless you look at carefully uh, and if these signs are very subtle, we may miss the diagnosis. So this is a very chaotic eye movements in all directions, but they are conjugated. So this is called uh, opsoclonus, and the entity is called opsoclonus myoclonus ataxia syndrome. And uh, it's a probably uh, one of uh, uh, it's probably the uh, most common paraneoplastic cerebellar syndrome which we see in children, paraneoplastic uh, uh, CNS involvement, which we see in children. Uh, generally subacute, but sometimes acute presentation, at least acute recognition is known. 50% have underlying neuroblastoma, fortunately grade one or two, and it can be anywhere in the abdomen, thorax, th thorax or even in the neck. And the, another is thought that the etiology probably viral or post-viral. We need CT abdomen, chest, uh, including neck, and sometimes treatment uh, at least if you found a neuroblastoma or not, and then immunotherapy with the steroids, immunoglobulins, and other immunomodulators. This is very interesting uh, personal case. Uh, uh, Eight-year-old girl with the seizures, focal uh, seizure, uh, which are motor and were associated loss of awareness for one year. Once in two, three months, normal development, negative family history, normally the normal brain MRI. She was on treatment with carbamazepine followed by levetiracetam and then clobazam in combination as well. And if she failed, she continued to have seizures every one to two, uh, every two to three months. At age 10, she started having gait difficulties, tremulous hands, some facial grimacing was noted. She, uh, examination of course, real, real cerebellar atex and some coriform movements of the face. No other neuro deficits. Easy showed bilateral occipital spikes at this time. Brain MRI uh, retrospectively thought this, uh, compared with the first brain, probably there is some minimal cerebellar dystrophy. Thyroid, anti TPO, ANA, vitamin E, basic metabolic work was all negative. And uh, I think that uh, what uh, uh, I added another test to the uh, this uh, panel. I don't remember why now, but it's long old case, and we found that had anti TTG is more than three hundred. We did a duodenal biopsy, no gross change, but lymphocytic infiltrates were present. So we made a diagnosis of a gluten ataxia in this child. Treated her with a gluten free diet, and uh, she remained seizure free. Ataxia resolved, everything resolved, and even anti epileptic drugs were tapered off. And currently she's sixteen year old and without any epilepsy and ataxia. And she's been off AD almost, I think, four or five years now. So gluten ataxia is a kind of sporadic ataxia uh, associated with the presence of circulating anti-glide and antibodies with no alternative etiology. And the diagnosis of gluten ataxia is independent of presence or absence of entropathy. It's not always, but this child never had GI symptoms. 
And uh, in certain studies accounts for 20% of all ataxias and 45% of idiopathic sporadic ataxias. Insidious onset uh, starts with gait ataxia, limb ataxia, lower limbs, more than the upper limbs, peripheral neuropathy is present. Uh, we have other signs, gauge of open nystagmus. Some patients may have other uh, involuntary movements like myoclonus, chorea, or palatal tremor, opsoclonus, uh, but majority of uh, them have uh, ataxia. These symptoms are seldom seen, means less than uh, maybe one fourth of these patients may have G concurrent GI symptoms. Uh, male and female are physical studies. So, uh, ocular signs are present uh, in 80% ataxia, between 70 to 90%. Gate ataxia is in almost uh, everyone. Anti glider antibodies in uh, almost everyone. Uh, entropathy on biopsy just in 28%. So that means you may you don't have to have uh, GI symptoms to suspect this diagnosis. And maybe we are under investigating this, these kind of patients. Other immune mediators, cerebellar ataxia, especially in kids, uh, haven't seen any anti cat uh, cerebellar ataxia, Hashimoto encephalopathy, have seen, but not as one patient, yes, I've seen with the cerebellar ataxia due to Hashimoto. Autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, Malinating disorders, ADEM, um, especially anti-MOG antibodies positive uh, where the cerebellar involvement can have cerebellar ataxias. Now coming to uh, chronic ataxias, uh, which are less common and which are largely genetic in origin, though few of them can be acquired also. The genetic can have any mode of transmission or recessive dominant X-linked or mitochondrial inheritance. The sporadic cases, uh, some of them actually do represent genetic, but there is no family history because this is the only child the family has, especially in autosomal recessive. And even in autosomal dominant, the father may not have a, a symptom yet. This can be, chronic ataxia can be progressive, like in a degenerative metabolic disorders, and can be non-progressive in posterior fossa malformations. And some of them are treatable, so we need to recognize those treatable disorders. And MRI shows either cerebellar malformation or atrophy. Uh, this is child, uh, this is how the cerebellar atrophy looks on sagittal images. And this is the atrophy you see on uh, uh, axial images. The autosomal are ataxia, vitamin E deficiency related ataxia, ataxia, telangiectasia is uh, is seen, uh, especially ataxia, telangiectasia is uh, probably the most common autosomal recessive cerebral ataxia in this part of the country, uh, which I see. Uh, the others dominant uh, are rare, so it's, and this is the stock is for uh, largely for uh, uh, PG residents and uh, practicing pediatricians, so I'm not going to talk about much about this one. Let's talk about a little bit which uh, are uh, disorder which we see reasonably frequently uh, causing chronic non-progressive ataxia. And, and these are one which are Dandy Walker syndrome, Arnold Cherry malformation, Joubert syndrome, is classical molar tooth sign of Joubert syndrome. So MRI can diagnose this uh, very well, unless you need uh, genetic confirmation or genetic testing for other purposes, the MRI is something which is required, uh, that's it. You don't need many other investigations of uh, blood work. Post-surgical means patient who have had surgery in the cerebellar area because of uh, uh, some um, uh, uh, cerebellar pathology and now patient is left with the chronic ataxia and non-progressive post-brain tumor surgery post surgical after cerebellar abscess has been taken care, something like that. And it can be a sequel to chronic uh, acute insult in the past following trauma, infection, or stroke. And that patient is left with a chronic ataxia, which is non-progressive. So chronic acquired ataxias, hypothyroidism, drugs, especially phenytoin, the myelinating illnesses, MS and others, neoplasms, paraneoplastic, Gluten ataxia some can be chronic. Nutritional deficiency can cause it chronic, but this is, these are not the very common cause of uh, uh, chronic ataxia in children. A example uh, of chronic ataxia, which uh, we see six-year-old boy having uh, ataxia since he started walking, 
He walked with difficulty with swaying, falling, poor balance. Parents were non uh, consanguineous. An examination showed some head tilt, strabismus, hypomimic face, hand tremors on intention, and ATX gait. Uh, this is uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, you can easily make here. Uh, if you see carefully in the eye, you can see telangiectasia in the eye uh, here and also here. And this is a patient uh, who had a different presentation, but the same diagnosis. She presented with a severe dystonic posturing, but then this case was presented in some of the conferences, but when you closely looked at uh, into her eyes, you you see you see, you see atex. Yeah. So this was a kind of a dystonic presentation of the entity called ataxia tangentasia. So this is caused by mutation in ATM gene. Motor apraxia, other involuntary movements are not uncommon, rather, they are commonly present. Cordial dystonia, like especially at the hell tilt. Ocular telangiectasias are present generally after five year of phase. So, in a younger children, it may be difficult to. Immunodeficiency, recurrent infection, another hallmark, malignancy later in life because of immunodeficiency. The classic. Uh, uh, Blood work shows uh, blood finding is uh, raised alpha fetoprotein in more than 95% of the patients. And MRI shows cerebral atrophy, uh, not a treatable cause uh, uh, we have here. Then two other uh, similar presentations, but a different diagnosis, ataxia with oculomotor apraxia type one, type two. The hallmark are that no telangiectasia, the representation is like uh, uh, oculomotor apraxia with ataxia. The type one has, uh, hypoproteinemia and hypolipidemia with hypercholesteremia and type 2 has a high alpha protein but normal albumin. So these two investigations can help you kind of differentiate. Frederick uh, is not is common but not very common at least in this part uh, of the country. Uh, it's caused by uh, gene mutations in Fretexin gene uh, where we have abnormally expanded GAA triple nucleotide repeats. Onset is before 10 years of age or around adolescence. And the combination of presence of pesticides, optic trophy, hearing loss, and later on diabetes and cardiomyopathy uh, is seen in these patients. Uh, then uh, this is something which we should always keep in mind because this is treatable. The onset is before 20 years of life. Uh, this is ataxia with the vitamin E deficiency or event. Kind of same presentation as Friedrich ataxia, uh, but two things are a little uh, different. The cardiomyopathy is less common than Friedrich ataxia, and dystonia and head detubation are more common and a little more specific for this ataxia of the vitamin E. And it's treatable with 800 milligram per day of vitamin E. Earlier you treat better it is because the response may not be complete in every patient. Go to one, every pediatrician or pediatric neurologist loves this the diagnosis. A very diverse clinical manifestation this uh, entity has, but cerebral ataxia is one of them. Uh, maybe pure cerebral ataxia and, uh, and uh, maybe about 20, 30%, but frequently other manifestation like uh, cognitive deficits, epilepsy, or existential movement disorders. The characteristic finding on investigation is the ratio between CSM blood glucose is less than 0 0.4. It's called CSM hypoglycodicia. The, the transporter deficiency uh, causes uh, failure to transfer glucose from blood to the CSM. It's caused by mutation in LC, uh, SLC2A1, and treatment here is a ketogenic diet. Few words about uh, recurrent or intermittent ataxias. Uh, these are called uh, one uh, common, uh, one not common, but one of the causes is uh, what we call channelopathy is causing episodic ataxia type one to seven, migraine and its variants, uh, including basal migraine, familial hemiplegic migraine, and in young kids, benign paroxysmal vertigo, torticollis, uh, 
is uh, another uh, entity which can cause intermittent ataxia. Then we see uh, benign paroxysmal vertigo is very common. One to two year old child coming, coming, running or coming to parents saying, I have a chakkar or I have a vertigo is mostly this diagnosis. Epilepsy sometimes can manifest with the ataxia, ep uh, ictal ataxia. And then we always keep in mind these rare metabolic disorders uh, uh, when patient has uh, intermittent ataxia. And this is uh, the genetic mutations uh, between them. Uh, type one uh, has uh, ataxia with the myokemia and attacks are very brief, last for just seconds to minutes and they occur maybe daily. They're triggered by exercise fever, stress, and mutation is in the KC and uh, potassium uh, channel gene. Uh, may respond to estrogolomide, but not uh, as good as the type two, uh, which is caused by calcium channel mutations. Uh, in, in addition to ataxia, patient has nausea, dysarthria, vertigo, uh, uh, other than ataxia, and may have a migraineous headache. And this disorder is allelic with uh, Spinocerebellar ataxia type six and familial hemiplegic migraine type one, and this is response to type uh, to uh, uh, estrogolomide very well. Then some close to genetic uh, ataxia is just uh, kind of a uh, 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 very brief overview, and these signs can be clues can be neurological, non-neurological related to laboratory and neuroimaging. So talked about these signs before also. These signs suggest other specific kind of uh, ATX, at least they help you narrow down your clinical diagnosis. Eye movements of different kind, uh, especially uh, if you are uh, very critical of these eye movements, you can make a diagnosis, but there's too many of them and too many of uh, uh, ataxias, it's probably difficult to remember each one. So best is you keep a ready reckoner with you whenever you deal with that. Blood investigations, again, depend on what clinical suspicion is. And these are, I don't want to just go by uh, every investigation, but it again depends on your clinical suspicion. MRI probably is, again, very helpful, can, can diagnose a lot of things, including cerebellar, junior cerebellar hypoplasia, or cerebral hypoplasia, vermin involvement, and they have a differential diagnosis for each one. Global cerebral hypoplasia, panto cerebral hypoplasia, there are one to 11 types of this, and then pure cerebellar atrophy, ataxia, telectasia, and many other disorders which cause pure cerebellar atrophy. Cerebellar atrophy with hypomyelitis. Cerebellar atrophy with the white matter abnormalities have a list of differential diagnosis. And so many other uh, findings can help you narrow down the diagnosis. And just skipping this. And then if you, as I said, if you see hypomyelination on MRI in, in a patient with ataxia, you have a lot of differential diagnosis to entertain. Uh, this is an excellent recent study, uh, which uh, is a kind of a clinical algorithm for early onset cerebellar ataxia covers. Uh, genetic at, or hereditary ataxia as we said before 25 year phase and say uh, good study to read. And then just uh, before I come to the concluding slides, treatable causes which you should always keep in mind in patients who have ataxia, if it is episodic, keep episodic ataxia in mind, especially type two and one, which can respond to estragolamide in acute ataxia, cerebellitis, because uh, Cerebellitis can cause a lot of cerebellar swelling and can cause herniation and kill the child. So keep in mind, portion infectious cerebellar ataxia it resolves within two weeks of treatment. And then drug and toxins like phenytoin, always keep in mind, unless we keep in mind, we won't make a diagnosis. Gluten ataxia, anti-GAD and other uh, ataxia is caused by hypothyroidism, absoclonus myoclonus syndrome, and then Chronic progressive treatable includes uh, vitamin E deficiency related A beta lipoproteinemia, the cerebral tenderness and thematosis, Neiman Peck disease, Friedel ataxia, though not uh, eminently treatable, but some something is happening in this regard. And of course, Q CoQ10 deficiency, uh, where CoQ supplementation can help. So, uh, in summary, uh, cerebellar ataxia is a common problem. The accurate diagnosis is possible uh, 
like uh, uh, in the introduction, ma'am said, we pay attention to history, physical findings, and neuroimaging. And these three things can kind of give you a lot of clues. It's very helpful clinically to divide ataxia as into acute, subacute, chronic, and intermittent because that can help you uh, in deciding the type of uh, intervention and type of uh, investigation you need to undertake. Most cases of acute ataxia uh, are due to acute cerebellar insult. And the post infectious uh, or infectious cerebellar ataxia is the most common uh, and accounting for more than 50%. Fortunately, leaving a couple of uh, bad diagnosis, most acute cerebellar ataxia are treatable. For example, acute post infectious cerebellar ataxia is treatable. Intoxication related is treatable. The chronic ataxias, on the other hand, are uncommon and mostly are genetic or hereditary. Of course, some are required, acquired. Genetic diagnosis now is possible, not in all, but in many. And uh, then in a chronic ataxia, always try to find out a treatable cause or focus at least exclude a treatable cause. And in contrast to adults, the diagnosis of uh, uh, chronic genetic diagnosis uh, is very important in children uh, from point of view of prenatal diagnosis to prevent the birth of another child with a similar illness. Thank you very much everyone for being there. And uh, I'm open to any questions if you may have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goraya, for that very uh, comprehensive uh, talk on uh, uh, approach to ataxia in children. <clears throat> uh, I think it's very important to understand the temporal profile of uh, the and the evolution of the symptoms. Um, <clears throat> one other common uh, condition which we call we uh, see is um, the what we call the spastic ataxic cerebral palsies. Um, which is non-progressive ataxia. And you, especially you see it in children who have thalamic injury in addition to the periventricular leukomalacia, uh, what we call the non-progressive ataxias. And also, of course, you also touched up on the um, malformations of uh, cerebellum and brainstem, which can again uh, cause, is responsible for a non-progressive ataxias in addition to all the other acute, subacute, and chronic ataxias. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, talk. Um, and uh, over to Dr. Gurpreet to moderate the question and answer session. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Guraya. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Maya Thomas. Uh, there are a few questions, uh, sir. Uh, what is the localization for opsoclonus? In opsomyoclonus ataxia, where do we localize opsoclonus? As such, uh, in uh, ophthalmoclonus, myoclonus, we don't, but uh, follicular nodular lobe is the one, uh, especially the follicular node, which is responsible for controlling eye movements. So, uh, in in a patient like in ophthalmoclonus, myoclonus syndrome, uh, the involvement uh, generally is not picked up on MRI to suggest that what part of the is normal. The MRI is normal, but I localize it to a kind of follicular or follicular nodular lobe in that case. What is the localization of frontal ataxia, gait ataxia, and limb ataxia within the cerebellum? Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, see, uh, truncal ataxia uh, is a kind of a warmus. The midline is midline. So, you can, and gait ataxia is also midline. The, the truncal and gait ataxia you can see in a floccular nodular and vermilion. And limb ataxia is seen in the cerebellar hemispheres. So, uh, you have. Uh, if the right or left hemisphere is involved, limb ataxia is a dominant feature. But it's rarely that you will have a pure feature. There will be some kind of minimal symptoms of other kind of uh, Another question is about frontal lobe ataxia. What are the clinical signs of frontal lobe ataxia? Any strong clinical handles on history and examination for the same? I think I, I, I will not be able to, I, 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 I skipped that frontal lobe because I was going to talk about cerebellar ataxia. So if someone, maybe ma'am can, if someone knows about, uh, can answer that question. Yeah, I think uh, uh, frontal lobe uh, ataxia is uh, I, the kind of the terminology is uh, kind of uh, 
uh, now kind of outdated. It is more of a gait apraxia uh, that you see in uh, frontal lobe uh, disorders. And uh, the way you can differentiate frontal lobe, whatever the gait apraxia is, you have, of course, other features of a frontal lobe uh, uh, dysfunction. Uh, and of course, you don't see the other classic uh, you know, signs of uh, cerebellar disease. So that is how you would differentiate a frontal lobe, a gait apraxia, or what you call a frontal lobe, uh, you know, frontal ataxia. It's more of a gait apraxia than an ataxia. I think it's also like a small shuffling gait, hesitant gait, just like Parkinsonism. In, uh, it's just like how you see a, you know, a, a child who's learning to walk. That's what how you classically describe, you know, an apraxic uh, gait, frontal lobe gait. Uh, what is the best investigation to investigate paramyoplastic? I mean, uh, among CT, chest, thorax, uh, or MRI, which is uh, better for uh, ruling out neuroblastoma? And uh, is there any role of MIBG scan in this era of advanced neuroimaging? Okay, I think uh, uh, investigating for paramyoplastic uh, syndrome or neuroblastoma is a stepwise uh, 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 approach. So chest X-ray, ultrasound abdomen, we generally start with because sometimes you can pick up if the tumor has a reasonable size. If that is not the case, then you go for CT. Uh, in our center, our radiologist is much more comfortable doing CT chest abdomen or reading CT for neuroblastomas. They are not very comfortable doing uh, with the MRI, uh, but the literature does mention that both CT and MRI uh, can be used to uh, diagnose uh, neuroblastoma or at least detect neuroblastoma. Even for resorting to, to these investigations, I think uh, uh, the investigation which we can do at least to enhance our suspicion of neuroblastoma is uh, urinary VMA and other catecholamines, or at least uh, if 24 hour urine is not possible uh, because these kids are small, uh, either you catheterize them or you can do. A VMA creatinine ratio, uh, and there are norms for that, and that can help you. And how aggressive you should be with the, if it is elevated, of course, you will suspect a neuroblastoma, and you try everything to find out, including MIBG scan if the CT and MRI are normal. But if it is normal, then a lot of times we leave it at CT, and uh, because MIBG scan is not available everywhere and it costs a lot of money. So treatment, if the uh, neuroblastoma is very small, uh, probably remains the same. Uh, and most of these neuroblastoma actually later on regress. So I'll stop at CT, um, CT uh, if uh, the question on normal other things, uh, maybe I, I might be scanned. The other thing is that it's recommended that the first time you found nothing on and your patient has not improved, it still, still continues to have a symptoms, uh, symptoms worsen again after treatment, and maybe another look after six months to one year uh, at uh, this tumor uh, is, uh, is uh, recommended. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think PET CT also has a role these days to diagnose it. Yeah. Okay. What's uh, next is what is the relation between focal epilepsy and glutenic exit? As such, there is no uh, direct relationship, but of course, gluten is uh, a cause of epilepsy as well as a cause of ataxia. So patients, like my patient had both epilepsy and later on developed ataxia. A patient can have these symptoms independent of each other. It does not, uh, it's not necessary that patient with epilepsy will develop ataxia or patient with ataxia will develop epilepsy. Uh, how many days should we continue vitamin E to see the response in suspected cases? I don't think we have a time frame because this is this is a chronic attack. Here, the response is also going to be very slow. It's not uh, kind of we treat it and uh, things are going to get better immediately. And also, depending on how late we have started treatment, the response may not be complete. So best would be to now is possible to confirm confirm genetic diagnosis at least uh, if not genetic diagnosis do vitamin E levels if vitamin E level is low and you suspect a genetic vitamin E uh, deficiency related uh, then we should continue for a long long time or maybe unless we document uh, that the, despite vitamin E patient has worsened. Uh, 
but it again will be probably very uh, unethical to stop vitamin E in a patient who has vitamin E deficiency related ataxia but has not improved. But maybe maybe it's, it's not worsening. Uh, and the last one is how long immunotherapy has to be continued in OMA or somatomas ataxia? Duration of immunotherapy. It depends which I mean, it depends which immunotherapy we are talking about. Each one has a, a protocol uh, for uh, starting with the uh, dexamethasone or uh, ACTH or even methylprednisolone, uh, IVIG. Like when, uh, for example, if patient has received steroids and then he has not responded and is you know IVIG and he has improved, then monthly IVIG is continued for quite some time, maybe 12 months or maybe even longer, depending upon, uh, I don't think we have a very defined end point uh, in these patients other than uh, clinical judgment based on uh, response. Yeah, I think uh, OMA treatment, uh, you know, it's quite prolonged. Uh, it definitely goes on for one to two years. We need to con continue some form of immunotherapy. With regard to that uh, question uh, on the, you know, which is the appropriate modality, this 24-hour urine, we have, may, we have not really, and metanephrins uh, somehow, uh, we have not found, uh, you know, uh, a good correlation with, uh, even with new, the children who have neuroblastoma, uh, maybe because they are non-functioning uh, uh, tumors. So we never really find a good correlation, but even then, despite that, we still do it. But the best modality, I would say, is depending uh, is you know on the radiologist's uh, experience. Also, it's either a CT or if you have a very good uh, pers a person who can interpret CT, of course you'd go for a CT. But of course, MRI will uh, pick up also uh, very small lesions. Okay, thank you, uh, Guraya sir and uh, Maya ma'am for uh, participating in this. And it was a very uh, great lecture. So uh, next week, uh, uh, Sneha, can you project the next week's program? So the maximum questions were from uh, uh, neuroblastoma and opsomyoclonus ataxia. So to uh, tickle our nerves, we will have a very uh, uh, thought-provoking lecture next week. Uh, so please do attend. It will be on opsomyoclonus ataxia syndrome. Uh, this week, so Dr. Mark Gorman will be speaking on it from Harvard Medical School, USA. It will be moderated by Dr. Lokesh. So uh, please attend this session if you're interested in the way. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, I think thank you, can... Gurpreet. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And thank you, ASEAN. Thank you, Dr. Goraya. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gurpreet. Okay. Thank you all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Anaita. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone.